All right, oh, time to uh, turn our attention to football, and we have a lot to get through with our next guest. It is an agenda that is uh, that fill, fills over, uh, Kevin Caban. How are you getting on? I'm good. I'm good, Adrian. Good to see you again. I've not been on for a while, have I? It's been quite a, a, quite a long time, really, since I've spoken with you. Hasn't been for the lack of trying on our part. Well, apart from a few private messages, you know, we send each other a few WhatsApps uh, a couple of times a week, don't we? Apart from that, but we're, we're, we're in touch enough, but just not, uh, not on, uh, on the show or anything. I get a weekly review uh, into my phone, some Friday afternoons, some Saturday afternoons. And I have to say, to be fair, it uh, can be very cutting at times. I think it's quite reasonable, you know. Positive, positive, positive feedback, positive and negative feedback, whichever it is. I'm giving you feedback on the show. You know, I've, I've got a lot to say about Owen when I'm, when I'm messaging you as well. A lot to say about, about Colm over the last couple of weeks. Um, yeah. Uh, so there's, there's a lot to be said at times, isn't there? A lot that needs to be said. A lot that needs to be said, I might add, yeah. I played, uh, I wouldn't be in the habit of sharing the information you send over, but I did happen to be in Colin's <laughs> company yesterday, Friday, uh, last Friday evening. I did play him the uh, bit where you weren't happy with him. You weren't having his, uh, like, what are these Everton fans doing celebrating on the pitch after the Palace win stuff? No, it, it wasn't that. There was probably, there's probably a little bit of that. You, I, I can understand that. You, know, you, give, you, you take what he's saying, things like that, that's fine. But it was more that, he actually wanted to look at it through the eyes of what Roy Keane would think about it. Not his, it's not even his own opinion now. He's looking at somebody else to get to gather an opinion from, isn't he? So that was quite interesting. That was the interesting take that I, I took from it, really. Roy Keane puppet. Roy Keane, <laughs> Roy Keane puppet. <laughs> <laughs> no, you never would have known, would you? The, the man's obsessed. There is, and like, not, we don't need to get into it right now, but there is definitely like a post Saipan well, this is the right things, the right way to do things. That wasn't all bad, by the way. I definitely had like uh, a positive impact in the country in terms of like best practice and you know how we, we shouldn't be settling. I look at it's it's not really the debate about Everton bit on the pitch. You were um, delighted, obviously, post Palace. They yeah. packed up packed up the bags after that, obviously last weekend, but job done at that stage. I, yeah. I'd say there'd be some partying done um, after that game, wasn't there? It was um, no, I, I think it was job done. I, I I think you touched on it, and you you touched on it. Regardless of how a season goes, Everton's you know priority at the start of the season or target at the start of the season was not just to avoid relegation, but when when we get to thirty and thirty two games, the reality is in front of you where Everton are. You've got you've got to deal with the situation that you're in, and. Um, I think I, I'd sent a message to you, Adrian, hadn't I, about th there was a great interview. You know, I, it might have been on the World Feed. It might not have been on Sky with uh, Michael Keane and uh, Dominic Calvert-Lewin. And you could hear in the voice of Michael Keane what he was saying, uh, you know, the expectancy of playing for Everton. I, I remember when I signed for Everton and we've got, you know, Bill Kenwright, the chairman, would, would come in and, and, and speak to the players here and there. And he'd, he'd constantly bring up former players' names. We had Dave Hickson, who was a club legend, who would be coming around the changing rooms before the games. And, you know, we were always in the shadow of uh, Alan Ball, of um, Colin Harvey, Howie Kendall, Andy Gray, Graham Sharp, all these players because of the rich hist history that they had. And that club was on the verge of relegation. You can't get away from that. And the players were feeling it, regardless of who's wrong and who's right, who's to blame for Everton getting themselves in that situation. And the wages that Everton are paying now, astronomical wages, they should not be in the position they're in. We all know that. But they're still human. They were still feeling that pressure for the last six or eight games of the season. And I, I think it's full credit to them. And maybe even Lampard, I think you touched on it yourself, Adrian, you know, to, to galvanise the club and, I think Lampard recognised that he had to get the fans on board with him to really take to Lampard before even they take to the players and the club itself. I think there was a bit of that. Lampard had to really get to get a feeling for what the fans wanted from him and maybe what he wanted from the fans. And to, to, to get the turnaround the way that they did in those last few weeks, it, I think it was a special end to the season for them, really. And yes, we all know it's not where Everton should be, you know, given what the pain transfer fees were paying. The Frank Lampard commentary obviously is uh, fairly regular. What's your thoughts on him? Obviously, he's he done enough now to, uh, to move on, obviously, next season and all that. Are you uh, having him in the parlance 
Um, I, I, personally, I, I think he was probably a little bit, I, I, I was going to say lucky then. I wouldn't say lucky. It's maybe a wrong thing to say. But I think fortunate to get the job in the first place. Um, if I was looking at where Everton were in, at, at that time, the position that they were in, there wasn't really much to suggest to me from Frank Lampard's CV that he was able to you know, take a club in the bottom half of the table and get them safe and, and start to rebuild. Did a good job at Derby. Obviously, didn't get them promoted in what he did. Chelsea's budget and the players that they had and everything was always going to suggest they were going to be a, you know, a toxic club. That was how it was going to be. So I didn't necessarily see the fit for Everton personally when he, when he got the job. But um, I think he's I think he's proved certainly that he's he, he's in touch with the club. You, you know, we've seen all the little clips that have come out on social media, you know, we've seen the bit where he was talking about Seamus Coleman and talking about the players and the group of players that he has. There's a rebuilding job, yes. Um, Lampard will obviously oversee that with, with us at the club, but I think he's, I don't know, he's grown on me. That's what I would say. I do right. think he, he, des- he deserves, he deserves the, uh, the job uh, long-term now. And I would like to see him given a good crack at it. And, a, and, you know, a lot that, you know, maybe the club can move forward with him now and they can, basically build something hopefully I'm I'm hopeful that something can be built that's quite special going forward Without looking back too much obviously on uh, the end of the Premier League Kev the Champions League final obviously took ahead to this weekend Liverpool against Real Madrid there were parts of that game I have to say uh, at the weekend the, the Liverpool Wolves match where geez, they looked really heavy legged in a way that I thought God even regardless of what happens here today this could have an impact next weekend is the Champions League the sort of mm. Champions League final the sort of a game that you just are able to put all that stuff to one side and it doesn't catch up with you? Or is there a point in the game where you've just become so tired from uh, from the season that like no matter what you're doing, an hour, 70 minutes into the game, it starts to hit you? It probably depends how the game's going, doesn't it? I think we're all in reality. that If Liverpool are a couple of goals up, two or three goals up, it does become easier for them. If, they, if they're struggling to break down Real Madrid and maybe even a goal down or whatever it would be and they're chasing the match, then that tiredness can can seep in a little bit. But I, I don't know. I, I I honestly felt the weekend, I, I know it didn't really go the way that I, maybe I expected it with, with City going down 2-0. I, I thought City would prevail and get and get the job done. I think many many of us all thought that. Um, so there was a little bit of maybe looking towards that Real Madrid game, not necessarily quite at it. I'm sure that Liverpool and Jurgen Klopp wouldn't say that, but it, it looked a little bit that way to me. There's always a bit of madness around Liverpool, isn't there, I feel. I think that's what, makes Klopp so warming. There's always a little bit of, uh, you know, I don't know, just 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 chaos around the team. I think when you're watching them, you, 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 it's never as controlled as Man City. The City seem to control games. And with Liverpool, you always feel as though there's a chance that's going to be given up, however that's going to be. So I think that's going to be the case this weekend. But um, I think Liverpool are a better team. I think they'll be able to raise the game. And in answer to your question, I think, I think Liverpool will be will have enough on the board so that legginess and that tiredness won't necessarily uh, be as uh, be as prevalent. I think maybe at 16, 17 minutes. It it feels like a very very interesting build up where the night Real Madrid beat Manchester City or that week certainly there was a feeling that you know Liverpool are are, are heavy heavy favourites for this game. They still are if you look at the, the betting lines yeah. for this match. But it feels the general conversation has changed a bit over the last couple of weeks. It's almost like a build up to an All Ireland final where the underdog almost has a chance more the more the days go by, even though there's absolutely no evidence for that. It feels like that's the way the conversation has moved for Real Madrid over the last couple of days. Like, Do you feel that as well, that, that increasingly, I guess if you throw into the mix Liverpool's injuries, that you're starting to, to come around to the idea that Real Madrid really could upset the odds at least this weekend? Well, I mean, I'm not saying you, 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 you're, you're basically asking me to sit on the fence, aren't you, with what, with what I've already answered. I think Liverpool <laughs> will win the game, but... Um, but no, I, I think we all know with what Real Madrid have done, with those amazing comebacks, with what Karim Benzema has done this season, you look at what they've achieved in getting to the... I think getting to the final was an incredible achievement for Real Madrid. I, I didn't think they'd, they'd probably get out of the last 16 this season. It didn't look like the, the Spanish sides were really up to it compared to where they've been in maybe uh, five, ten years ago. So for them to get to the final and do what they did against City, first of all, because let's be honest now... 180 minutes against uh, Man City or whatever, including the extra the extra time, 200 and whatever minutes, they were outplayed. They were outplayed. If, you're, if I'm looking solely in the 180 minutes in the two leg games in normal time, they were outplayed for probably 175, 170 minutes of, of that tie. And they found a way to win the game. So 
they can be outplayed in the game. Liverpool will create chances. Liverpool will be having that real high pressure game, that real, you know, dynamic running style that we've got. And it's hard to play against. But Real Madrid have got have found a way this uh, this season to stay in matches. And they've got enough quality in midfield with Modric and Cruz and, and people like this that can control the tempo of the game if they are under pressure. So I, I get what you're saying, but... I, I, I don't think Liverpool have got too much. I think defensively, I think they're better than Man City. I don't think they'll they'll let what happened uh, happen. Uh, what happened to Man City happen to them. Um, and I think they can deal with crosses a lot better. Real Madrid cross the ball a lot more than than maybe most sides do. Like from from what I've seen, certainly getting into wide areas, they put the ball in early. And I think Liverpool can deal with that more. I think they might even get behind Liverpool's fullbacks. They might get into crossing positions. Uh, but I think Liverpool will be able to deal uh, a lot better than Man City could with that. And I, I, I think Liverpool could win this 2-3-1. or three, one. I, I do think that. I, I, you know, 2-1's not necessarily convincing, but it might be a late goal for Real Madrid. I, I, I think this game could be comfortable enough for Liverpool, really. Like on that Real Madrid point, like there's been a bit of debate on the show over the last couple of months about whether Ancelotti is a good manager or a great manager. Like, where, where is where is he in in I guess the the general notional rankings in your head? Like, is he a top five manager, a top ten manager in Europe right now, or uh, or, or where do you see him? Uh, well, I, I, I from even from when he's when he was at Everton, I'm sure you know you're probably speaking to people that were involved with him uh, in in years to come. I'm sure of that as well. He's he's not necessarily a coach. He's not. He's not Jurgen Klopp the way that he, you know, is on the training ground or like Pep Guardiola is on the training ground constantly. He's, he's there, but he's not necessarily got the, the full hands-on day-to-day like those other coaches have. So from if you're looking at it from a coach, he's probably not in the top 10, no, but he has a way to, to get the best out of players. Yes, on the training ground, maybe little, little drops of information that he'll give the players. But certainly when it comes closer to the game time, he's been there, he's seen it. You know, certainly as a player, he's seen it. Certainly as a coach, he's seen it. And players are able to, to, to take on board what he says. So I think, I think for what he's achieved, certainly in the last 10 years, Owen, maybe 15 years, there's been no better coach in the Champions League, has there? So you have to give him the full credit he deserves for what he's achieved for that. So there's more ways to skin a cat, that's all I would say. There's, you know, it's not necessarily about being that hands-on coach every single day on the training ground. It's sometimes it is about taking that step back and evaluating what players you have and being able to talk to them, being able to speak to them. I think there's a lot of coaches don't have that skill. Personally, for even, even my experience, I found that. And I think Ancelotti, I remember listening to Mark Lawrence, and I think he was on with you and Jero, and where he was just saying about he's a, he's a good guy. He's a, I think people do warm to him, no matter what walk of life you're from. And I think he has that charisma about him that, that players can actually really attach themselves to. And I think that's where he's had his success. And, and I think that good guy persona has really been kind of played up as well over the last couple of weeks. Not that he's been trying to do that. Just it helps that you have a title win and all your players are on their phone. Yeah. And like you have the sort of affable old fellow with the cigar and the sunglasses. And like that helps yeah. the image when, when we're talking about it. Just, just on, on the flip side then, Kevin, with regards to one of the big storylines from Liverpool side of things going into this week, it is, of course, around Mo Salah. Mo Salah saying that he's going to be at the club next season. Sadio Mane says he will speak to the media after the match and shed some light on his future at the club. What do you think is going to happen here? What's your gut telling you with regards to those two players? Uh, I, I'd look at Mo Salah and probably it's wh- where he's going to go. Um, you know, is, is it solely going to come down to finances for them? Uh, Liverpool, as we probably, every, most would know, probably can't compete. They, won't be able, probably, they might not even be able to compete with, with Newcastle in the Premier League over the next few years, but they can't compete with Man City when it comes to, to wages. They can't compete with, uh, with PSG when it comes to wages. So if you're going to throw in, you know, an extra whatever million to a player a year when he's earning... 150, 200 grand a week, whatever it will be, is that going to make a difference to him? He, he, he has to see somewhere where both Salah and Mane have to see somewhere where they're going to be going to win trophies because Liverpool are in a prime position right now to be the dominant force in Europe or one of the dominant forces in Europe in contention for every trophy over the next two or three seasons. And before you know it, how old Salah now? And it's, he's approaching he, he 30, be, isn't he? He will be 31 next summer. So he's going to turn 30 this June, yeah. Yeah, so if you're looking at that, you know, if he gets, he might have two or three years at the level that he's at. Certainly, if you look at the amount of games that he's played over the last few years as well, obviously not wanting to tempt fate for him for his own career, but he's played a lot of games at such a high tempo, something I feel would always have to give when you're playing at that level. And it's the same with Mane as well. So unless they're going somewhere 
to, to, to seriously compete. I don't see the need for them to be going for to play for, for, for PSG or Real Madrid or whatever it would be, unless it's personally the personal prestige and whether it's something that's within that wants to play for those clubs. They're not going to get any better than Liverpool, I don't think, in terms of um, trophy contention over the next few years. So I, I, I personally think that, that it, their best option is probably to stay, but I'm not in their camp. I don't know what's happening around the agents. So I was even reading about um, Moussa Dembele today, which looks like he's leaving uh, Barcelona. Barcelona are not meeting his agents' demands, which is crazy when you think about it. It looks like he's going to sign for PSG because they can meet his agents' demands. It's not coming down to what a player wants now. It's what an agent can demand from clubs. So this, these factors are going to play in. I don't know who uh, Sané's agent is, or Mane's agent is, sorry, and I don't know who Salah's agent is, but... These agents now play a big role in in, in dictating where, where the players go, solely down to their their own uh, their own financial gain. Let's see what happens at the weekend. You pinned your colours as the master already, so I'm not going to ask you for a prediction on that. We do Sorry, Us- Usman Dembele. I got the name wrong there. Usman Dembele. Sorry. Sorry. Well, we're about. throwing Sane, Sane in there as well, so there was all sorts. Yeah, of I know. I, you know, you know. We got sorry, the gist. Sorry, we got the gist. We got yeah, the gist. Thanks. Thanks a lot. Um, you were uh, tweeting a couple of things during the week that we wanted to talk about. One of them was the uh, David Connolly, Jason McIntyre um, 20 year <laughs> celebration, Kev. Is that right? From the 2002 World Cup, the Saipan anniversary, I think is how we're, how we're terming all terming, uh, terming Saipan anniversary. Um, uh, yeah, 20 years, yeah. Yeah. Um, the, the, yeah, I think, I think Jason, start, J- Jason started off his piece, didn't he, by saying, I'd love to bury it in, what was that show that used to go and bury oh, it? Room 101, ne- yeah. Room 101, never, ne- never to be seen or heard of again. Yeah, I think there's a lot of us that feel a bit like that, yeah. Um, but that notwithstanding, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, he's Dev Connolly is sitting on the greatest Irish sporting documentary never made. Those yeah, tapes, I know. You were, you were, you're on those tapes. I think so, maybe on there somewhere. Probably most. I mean, all I remember with Dave, Dave's walking around with his camcorder. I think it was almost after the Nigeria game. It might have actually been over when we went over for the for Quinny's testimonial at Sunderland. I think Dave starts with the, with the camcorder, and you can imagine what the lads are like. Just Dave, get that fucking thing out of my face, will you? Will you go to the back? And Dave's like, "Oh, what do you think about this?" And imagine what he's, imagine Kenny. Can you just imagine Kenny with a camcorder stuck in his face when he's like, you know. Uh, when he's getting ready for preparing for a training session after he's had a bath for an hour and he's stretched on the corridor for two hours to get himself prepared for for a session, you know? Um, it, it's funny. It's funny when you think about it now that I, I think I've said it to you guys in the past privately when we've been speaking. I'm glad it's, I'm glad it's all out there now. Dave has had this tape for years and I, I, I've not spoke too much to Dave about it, but it's crazy to think that even, you know, leading up to it, what happened, Dave was walking around with his camcorder reaction on the bus after training, before training, all these sort of things. And also, that in the aftermath, what happened? Dave's, Dave's got the tapes there. I think there was a rumour going around that Dave had the camcorder set up in the meeting that night. I'm not too sure how accurate that is, but the, the camcorder set up uh, in that room and it was playing. But again, I don't know how, how accurate that is. Like you, I know the lads were talking about it during the week, but if you had that, you would be, I mean, I think it would be you know, half name in his price anyway, but bloody hell, that would be sensational. He doesn't, he know, doesn't actually have that, does he? It didn't seem like during the week that that was something that he was I never united. said that. that. There was a rumour. I think it was, I think it was Brini has said that at one time to me, that he actually, the, 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 the camera was rolling, whether or not it was, you know, they were both in shot, but certainly the, uh, I think there was, there was a rumour, again, I don't know, audio, that's what I'm looking for, Owen. Yeah, the audio's there, but I don't know how true that is. The uh, the entire affair um, obviously rests on this idea of the feigning injury bit, the faking injury bit, and Keane saying that McCarthy accused him of faking injury to miss out in the Iran game, the second yeah. game, you know that it was it was out of sight, and then there's so there's and then after that you start to unpack that there's all this stuff about an arrangement obviously between Ferguson and McCarthy that if there was a positive outcome in that first leg, which suddenly they understood it to be the case, um, but a misunderstanding almost kept. Uh, yeah. between that and what Mick McCarthy was actually asking him to apologise to the squad over. Is that fair enough? Or, or sorry, yeah, per, is that your reading of it? I don't want to be putting words in uh, Yeah. No, uh, no I, I've said it before, though. I've said it before, Adrian. I, I, this, I, I hadn't seen this this line coming out from Roy, actually, that he was accused of feigning injury. I, I didn't see this video that came out, and he must have said it on that video. I don't I'd never watched the video. I didn't even know there was a video out. Honest to God, I didn't know that. Uh I'd never really heard the heard the line from Roy that he was accused of feigning injury. And it probably stuck in my mind more. I was listening to a podcast that Roy was working for ITV, I think, on um, 
on the World Cup in, in Russia. And Roy said at the World Cup uh, that, you know, he goes, well, what, what was I supposed to do? I was accused of feigning injury. I had to defend myself or, or worse to that effect. And it was, I, I, I never heard that. I don't think any player has ever really been asked that question. Did you hear Mick McCarthy tell Roy that he feigned injury to miss an Island game? I, I've, never, I've never heard one player even answer that question. Uh, that oh, was, I, that was never said in the room. No, but it was never said never in the room. Said. Right. Well, I mean, there was honestly, it was never said. Now it could be misconstrued uh, that 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 was said. What Mick said to him was Mick had obviously brought up this article that Roy had written with Tom Humphreys, and uh, and he was talking about that, and he wanted an explanation for him writing this piece. And and Roy had said he said his piece, uh, whatever he'd said. I think you know people get the gist of what Roy had said to Mick. And Mick said to him, well, do you not think you owe these lads an apology? Because they went to Iran and finished the job. It it, it was an apology for what maybe Mick had read uh, from what Roy had said about us in this piece, saying that maybe some of the players aren't up to the standard and and not. I think, I I don't even know what was said in the interview, but in in that interview with Tom Humphreys, I'm just guessing. But there there was words to that effect that, you know, we a lot of the other players in the squad were questioned on maybe ability on, maybe their desires and all these sort of things. And I think I read it, I read it that back then that Mick was looking for an apology for that. Look, can you just apologise, lads? These lads went to Iran. They actually got the job done over in Iran. You, you weren't there. You went back to play for your club, Man United, and you didn't come and see the job through with us. It would, wasn't, would, you have, I, would, you have, would you have expected an apology for that? No, I wouldn't have expected an apology. But I, whether or not it was a, it was a provocative... Um, you know, message that was said to Roy, looking for a reaction. You know, from from that yeah. look, whether it, yeah, whether because, or not why, because was, why was he asking the question? If it I don't know, expected. honestly, yeah, but you'd have to ask Mick on that. But it, what, it yeah. certainly wasn't. It certainly wasn't saying, "Look, you feigned injury to miss an Ireland game." That was never said. Absolutely, never said in that room. And you know, and I'd probably say that the, every what everybody else that was in that room would probably back me up on that. That they never heard Mick saying, "Look, you feigned injury to to." Uh, to go back and play for your club. There was a, everybody knew those arrangements lots of times when Roy Roy didn't play friendlies. Roy stayed back at his club because he had injury issues and that was just the way that it was. There was no there was no issue with us at all for that. We all knew how it was. We we, we would have all preferred Roy having Roy for those big games and that was it. Personally from my point of view that was the biggest game of my career those two legs and I look back on my career and maybe they were the biggest because it was that final hurdle and actually getting the job done. So that's how I look at it but there was no suggestion from Mick to say that per- I never heard that. I didn't hear that. And, I, and I'd love if that question was ever asked of the players, look, did you hear Mick saying that Roy feigned injury to go back and play for United? Because I don't think that's, that was how it was said. Now that's how Roy probably took it. But even in that moment, I didn't read it that way at all. It's become, uh, it's become fact almost, is not it? Like, I yeah, it, it has become fact. I think it's, unf- I think, I think that is unfair that I said that I'd never, I never heard that. And, that's where it is. And, and I, I've never heard Mick being asked that question. Honestly, I'm sure Mick's probably spoken about it. But has Mick ever been asked the question, did you accuse Roy of being an injury? And I'm sure I'm, I've, never, I've never spoke to Mick privately about it. Honestly, I haven't. But I'm sure that Mick would, probably, would undoubtedly say I, I didn't because I never heard it. And it, I, honestly, as far as I'm concerned, that was never said in that room. So if, if that's how it was, how it was you know... Um, how how it came over to Roy, then that's how it came over. But no, I didn't. I didn't actually read that uh, like that at all, whatsoever. No, you'd nearly think like Mick McCarthy should have come out at some point. In the meantime, I know you're saying you've never been asked about it, but like, geez, you just want because it's such a fissure over here in terms of the split that it's created. That obviously uh, twenty years. Yeah, but ago, it, I mean, the, the split was there anyway. You know, I I, I even was it just a reason? Like, is, is, that, is that the essence of it? Was it just everybody looking for a reason to have a row? Um, listening to the lads, you could probably get that opinion the other day, uh, didn't you? You know, there was a there was a long journey. We we flown via I don't know what, what I, I can't remember. We did we flew Dublin Amsterdam I think Amsterdam Tokyo Tokyo Saipan, and you can imagine that we we done a lot of travelling and you know whatever you people might say, look prima donnas or whatever you know, narky little arseholes or whatever it would be. Um, but there was a lot of tension. Yeah, there was a lot of tension around the squad. Yeah, there was, particularly when we got there and the kit hadn't arrived. That was the big thing, wasn't it? The kit doesn't arrive. And everybody's now tetchy, edgy. Mix, obviously, totally pissed off that the kit's not arrived. 
but we've got to make do with the situation. And that was how it was. So we had to do some sort of training session and we did. Um, and then we turn up for the on the pitch and the pitch is horrendous. The worst pitch that, you know, we've, we've all played on some awful pitches in our time, but this was as bad as you're ever going to see. There was holes, potholes all over the pitch and we're, we're supposed to be preparing for a World Cup and this pitch is the, 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 the pitch that's been put on for us. So there was a lot of things you can imagine, can't you? You can imagine there's probably a few tackles going in training, a few flaring elbows going about. There was a lot that was happening. And then throw in the mix that the goalkeepers are not taking part in the game. You, 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 you know, I'm just, I'm probably trying to paint a picture of it there, but you can well imagine that a group of lads together that have been, you know, we've probably been caged up at that stage for only a, a week or so, not even that. But there was a lot of tension. Yeah, there was a lot of tension. And uh, I think that's probably what it all spilled over. I think certainly Roy had his, said his piece to Tom Humphreys or did his piece with Tom Humphreys in the Irish Times. And then it went it went from there, didn't it? There, there was a moment in the interview that Joe Malloy did with uh, Mick McCarthy in 2018 when they were speaking in the aftermath of the Jonathan Walters saga where Roy Keane accused him of spending a little bit too much time on the treatment table. And McCarthy said, you never accuse a player of feigning injury, do you? And Joe said, no, that's a load of common to make. McCarthy said, or do you have the right to do it? I don't know. And Joe said, are you saying that you didn't? And Mick McCarthy said, I'm not saying anything I did. Uh, so cryptic, but uh, yeah. it, it has it has kind of half been put to, to Mick McCarthy. Yeah, fair enough. Yeah, um, I was in on that interview with Joe as well. I was there with Joe when we interviewed Mick. Um, I don't even remember him saying that, to be quite honest with you. But no, I, cryptic. Yeah, fair enough. But I, I, I don't know. I, I, I think it's something that maybe Mick, Mick has been reluctant to speak about. I don't know. I, whether or not I, I missed something, whether or not that had been said privately between the two of them, I don't know. It could have been because they, they had had a series of meetings leading into that. So that could have been said privately. I don't know. That's that's my whole point. It Was it said privately? And that's what's maybe flipped everything up. I, I mean, I, I've said to you guys as well, I remember before that meeting start, Roy said it's going to go off tonight. So the the meetings that they'd all had prior, I was sat next to Roy eating dinner that, that evening. So... I was sat next to him when they were having the conversation with Mick. So, um, you know, they could have that could have been brought up. That could have been said to Roy privately, to him personally. That's why it went off the way that it did. I don't know. I don't know. That's why there's, there's so much within it that a lot of the players that even that were in the room that witnessed what happened at the end of it, there was so much that happened probably prior to that that we 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 never witnessed and we would never be privy to. You had dinner with him that night before the meeting. The night before the meeting, sorry, say that again. Is that what, what when did you have dinner with him? No, yeah, just, that, that, that no, during 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 the meeting the fallout. I was sat next to Roy when okay. the fallout was happening. Yeah. Right. I thought you knew that, didn't you? Yeah, you knew that. Yeah, I think I remember talking about it before, yeah. Yeah, I, okay. we, exactly, we don't need to talk about it now, do we? <laughs> <laughs> I come here one one last one for me. The Jason McIntyre interview I thought was interesting during the week because in the middle of it he said, if I've done anything, if I said anything to upset him, then I apologize for that. I've never heard Jason McIntyre being as conciliatory as that before. You're grinning as if to say maybe he didn't really mean it, but it did feel uh, as if it was something, he was saying something by way of an olive branch in so much as it would ever be accepted or in so much as it's worth. What's the, what, you, you're obviously in a different part of the world now and you don't bit, bump into him at games and I'm sure you're not uh, having a huge amount of texts over and back anymore, but, mm. um, you know, what is the feeling toward him now amongst the other players, is there any warmth, respect? What is it? Yeah, I, th I think Dave Conley had even said it the other day. You, you have to respect Roy totally for the player that he was and what he brought to our team. Roy was just an absolutely incredible footballer. Even listening to, to I was listening to Jer and Owen, I think it was on the morning of that when I was listening to their show, and, and Jer said Roy was the best in the world. and. You know, you can make that. You could easily make that argument that Roy was the best yeah. in the world. And personally, I would probably say I would probably agree with Jerry in saying that. Honestly, would there was no one better at controlling a game across the world? I don't think world football than him. Or he, you could actually put him up there with with anyone. There was a lot of players within that Man United um, team that people will put try to put on a higher pedestal than Roy, than Roy Scholes. Maybe some might even say Beckham or whatever. You know. Honestly, it's it's crazy because I know for a, I know even speaking to the guys that play for Man United around that time, that the one person that they 
trusted and relied on to take the ball, to do, uh, to control the game, to, to, you know, if they needed something, a, a bit of life brought to the game, it was Roy. Roy was an incredible, a incre- incredible player to dictate the, the, you know, the tempo of games and all of this, but Roy was an incredible player itself, full stop. So we all have an, an amazing amount of respect for Roy uh, from what he brought to our team. Absolutely. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> As well, what do you mean? Him. Well, like if you bumped in, no. if you passed him in the street right now, would you? Would there be an acknowledgement almost? I don't think he'd acknowledge me. I think that's probably what it would be. Um, <laughs> there's a, there's a lot of fallout. I, you know, I I'd probably out of nearly all the teammates, there's, 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 all my teammates that I would have played with you, I would always say hi. I, I speak to very few, very very few uh, that I would have played alongside. But there's there's still lads that you know, that I'm in contact with and I'll chat to them. Uh, but there's lads that I haven't seen for a long time and you, you could sit down and have a conversation. I don't think it would be the case with Roy. No, I think that he would he would totally ignore me and, and everything that I have to say. So I think there's a lot of players that's in that position and that's largely down to this. You're asking yeah. us questions about Saipan and you're asking us to, to give our opinion on it. And if we give our opinion on it, I give an opinion on Roy once where I felt he was maybe a little bit out of order where he was talking about players prior to 2016, uh, the Euros, when he named the squad. And Roy came out to name the squad. We, it was down in court, wasn't it? Down at Turner's Cross where we played mm. Belarus and the squad was announced that that day, after I think, that, that evening. After, uh, was it after that? I remember that game, yeah. Was it after that game it was announced? Yeah, just after just that before? game, the squad was yeah. announced. And Roy criticised Aidan Begidi, he criticised a few players. And I felt, I, 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 I was asked the question when I was on air, I said, look, you know, your assistant manager's saying that. And I, I personally just, I just said, I could only imagine sat in the dressing room with Roy Keane if Ian Evans, our assistant manager, or Chris Shooton or Noel O'Reilly, that, that I would have played in the same team uh, under. I could imagine what Roy would have been saying if those assistant managers would have been coming out criticising those players like he did. And I, and I said that. I said, I just can't imagine any other assistant manager criticising the players the way that Roy has criticised those players right now. And I think it is wrong. I don't think it's right at all. But um, when you say things like that about him, it, you know, the, the, uh, <laughs> um, the, the, uh, the fire has almost been set. And hasn't it? There's, there's, no, there's no comeback in Roy's eyes. You've criticised him and that's it. He, he, he won't talk to you again. He wasn't happy with you? No, not at all. Not at all. No, 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 no. <laughs> <laughs> well, leave, well, do you want me to that? elaborate? There's nothing else to say. I got a text message off him and that was pretty much it. So that's pretty much the end of that relationship. Yeah. Um, now, you set the uh, internet live a couple of weeks ago, Kev. Uh, it was about a thousand responses between your tweet and Stan Collymore was getting involved with various other uh, high, high profile celebrities. Um, and I think you've come to the right home for uh, for having this discussion about the greatest ginger footballers of all time, um, because you know there's at least two of us here, Kev, who are uh, who are fully signed up members to that family. At least two. I'm not yeah, sure if you're I'm, fully signed I, up, Adrian. I, I'm signed up. Well, he, no, he's not signed up to anything. You know, he changes he changes his spots every week. That boy doesn't he? You know that we know that. Yeah, exactly. He doesn't know where he's from, Owen. He doesn't know where he's from. He doesn't know who he is. So he just, you know, he tries to make out he's from Athlone. You never would have, you never would have known that. Any anyway. of the three of us has an identity crisis. No, I do have a bit. I do have a bit of ginger in me. I do. Yeah, my beard in my beard as well. Now I've got a bit of a messy going on with my beard. Uh, Messi obviously got. Could you claim Messi? Can you claim Messi for a could. ginger? You probably could. Yeah. Oh, gee, yeah. There you go. I've got mine's going grey now. Mine's going grey. My beard uh, where my ginger was, but no, I've got I've got a bit of ginger in there. Yeah. So we've we've tasked you based on you'd thrown out a tweet saying that who who are the greatest ginger footballers of all time, and there was as I said there was about a thousand responses to it. So we've tasked you with, uh, firstly, giving us the five players from your era between then and now, uh, five greatest ginger footballers. Got. Yeah, well, no. If we're going about the greatest of all time, I have to stop you there as well now because Jimmy Johnson. I know I'm a Celtic fan. I was a Celtic fan growing up, and Jimmy Johnson was always the name. Little Jinky was always the name. So, I I probably say the greatest of all time is Jinky Johnson. The greatest ginger of all time is is, is Jimmy Johnson. Everton as an Evertonian, everyone would tell me Alan Ball. Alan Ball is the greatest ginger of all time as well. So we. We have to start by saying those two are not in the mix because we haven't seen those two play. You and I, and, and Owen, Owen especially, hasn't seen those play. Um, but we have to, we have to throw some, uh, we have to throw those two names in right at the start. And I'd probably say that's one and two in the, the best gingers of all time, just to start with. And now okay. we can move on to to our era. It's not even Owen's era now because Owen probably won't remember some of these names. You know, you that's what makes you feel old. Kev. 
Yeah. Well, some, sometimes I listen to the show when you're talking to Owen and you'll throw a name in from 1990. I, I, I'm trying to think. I, I can't even think of a name now. Uh, a name that would have been quite prevalent to us or quite prominent to us watching Stephen Premier Effenberg. League. Stephen no. Effenberg. No, right, think, well, let's, think... let's throw that straight away. Stefan Effenberg straight away. He's got to be in the mix, hasn't he? He's got to be in the yes. top five. Owen's probably never heard of him. Hundred percent now. Hundred percent top five. I think also as well, you, you sometimes make it. You sometimes get confused between my youth and my stupidity. Uh, so <laughs> having not heard of a player doesn't necessarily mean that I was just too young. I could just yeah, uh, be yeah. completely completely uh, ignorance to their existence. You know. Yeah. All right. All right. I'll give you that one. I'll give you that one as well. Then. Yeah. Um, but trying to think of, yeah, I, I was actually trying to message you some names today. Uh, um, Adrian wasn't I trying to get you some names sent across to you just so you'd bring my mind. But obviously, obviously if, if you're looking at medals, won and talent and everything like that, Paul Scholes, obviously, and I've got to say Billy Bremner as well. Billy Bremner is one that we never would have seen as well. Another wing, G- Giles, can talk about, um, Billy Bremner, I'm sure, at some stage, but he was another ginger as well. But uh, I think the a, greatest a ginger player. footballer of all time to John Giles, I don't think it's an item that's going to go. It's not going to get out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but if you say, if you say, what you say to me, say, look, Kevin Coban says that Paul Scholes is better than Billy Bremner, yeah, and then yeah. wait for then the response. Away. That's the, away. Then and you know. Here, we, should, we should mention that it was actually the entire thing was kicked off by a Kevin De Bruyne masterclass a few weeks ago. Yeah. So, I mean, yeah. in terms of the current. Well, De Bruyne is right in the mix now. De Bruyne is yeah. probably going to easy into that top five isn't he uh if, if people, people people always talk about you know you can never judge a player on 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 how good they were unless they've won trophies which is absolute nonsense in, in my eyes honestly you, you you judge a player on the talent that they've got on the pitch and what they do and that wow factor and kevin de bruyne he has that wow factor doesn't he kevin de bruyne every single time over the last especially over the last four years i think he's taken his game to a whole new level and he, i think he's getting better even watching him at the Euros last summer where he, he was injured prior to the Euros and then he came on in that uh, Denmark game, wasn't he? He came on in the Denmark game at half-time, scored a brilliant goal with his left foot. If Belgium are going to have any sort of chance of winning the World Cup uh, this year, it's got to be down to Kevin De Bruyne. He, he's the, the main man, the best midfield player in the world, without a doubt in my mind, and um, the best player in the Premier League over the last few years, absolutely, without a shadow of a doubt. Just an incredible player. And as I said, he gets better and better. You've got uh, Big John Hartson. You've got Gordon. Oh, we've, got to, we've got to throw. We've got to throw Big John in, haven't we? We've got to throw yeah. a, a side of. I mean, are we going to throw Damien Duff into the mix? Are we going to throw Oliver Kahn into the mix? I think These Oliver Kahn makes the ginger. Duff or ginger. Oliver. I, uh, Duff, Duff, blonde. Duff would say blonde. Some strawberry might say blonde. strawberry blonde. But if, if I'm throwing these like names like John Hartson into the mix, who is a bona fide ginger, and I've known a lot of gingers as well in my career as well that. Literally, you know, we're, we're afraid of showing the roots, so that you know we can we can go but to that one another day. Some gingers, who, who no, not at all, not at all. No, they, they were, but there's a few. You know, I don't know if you did that yourself, Owen. Um, whether or not, were you growing up, you were, you know, you were embarrassed of your ginger hair. You decided to dye it blonde or dye it black or anything like that. Did, did you ever have that feeling? There's nothing wrong had with the, being ginger. Had the feeling, yeah, I had the feeling, but managed to resist the did feeling. You? I thought the eyebrows would be a bit of a giveaway. <laughs> did, you? did you? Well, no. It, 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 right, you know, I'll ask you an honest question. Then. So, why were we embarrassed about being ginger? Was it just the Good stigma question. that people would just give you? Like, I'm not being funny. Like. Yeah, I, yeah, yeah. Just like, the, the stick you'd get. You've got, you've got, a good, you've got a good head of hair on you. What, what's the, what's the big deal? No, but exactly. it's just exactly it's like anything that makes you a point of difference from the majority of other kids in the schoolyard. You're like, Correct. I don't want to be. I don't want to stand out. I just want to blend in. Correct. Yeah, yeah, that's it exactly. Yeah, that's, yeah. Co- that's correct. But when you get to a certain age, it doesn't really matter, does it? You, you don't care, do you? Do you care? No, you does, does it affect like, you? Does it affect you in your in your adult life? No, not at all. And in fact, it's kind of you're looking for points of difference once you become an adult because your life becomes yeah. uh, quite routine and boring, and uh, there is nothing to yeah. set you apart from anybody else. So, um, yeah, I, mean, I don't know now. what your relationship status is now, Owen, but I'm sure that your relationship status has been enhanced with having ginger hair. No. Absolutely not, but I'm, I thank you for having that uh, opinion. I'm glad that uh, a male footballer a million miles away uh, has that opinion that being ginger is more attractive. Well, I don't know. It's, 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 it's what's been said in the past to me. You know, I've, I've known... Um, really? I've known, yeah. But anyway, that's... There you go. I, 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 did, I, did, I didn't have the ginger hair to back it up, so, you know, I, I've got nothing to fall back on there, really. That's why I was trying to show my beard off, you know, to say I'm really ginger. No, <laughs> Gordon Strachan. <laughs> let's, let's... <laughs> Steve Nichol, uh, John Arnorisa, you've you've down here. I mean, he's got 
I don't no. know that he was ever sort of. I, I never, I'd never be putting John on a reset. We, we, I think you threw to me, threw back to me, Steve Staunton, Adrian. Um, Stan Steve Staunton, his head, 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 Stan is head and shoulders above John on a reset. I've got to put that out there right now. So if we're looking, if we're calling Stan a ginger, which he'd probably say blonde again, but Stan's ginger. Let's be honest. Um, he is right in the mix as well. Stan has to be in the mix there. Brilliant player that he was, you know? Coleman, Randall Coleman. Oh, yeah, K- Kuman, yeah. Well, again, one of the best European um, European Cup uh, winning goal. What, what, what year was that? Uh, 92, I think it was. 91, 92 at Wembley for Barcelona. So, yeah, great career. Brilliant. Um, yeah, top top class. So, we were looking for five there. I mean, I can, it was with Mateus Sammer. Uh, who else is yeah. there as well? Boniak um, is one that, that came up with Boniak, yeah. Well. Boniak, yeah. I mean, he was brilliant, wasn't he? Polish striker, brilliant himself. Uh, I'm sure, again, there's going to be lots and lots of names, even when this goes out, that's going Ray to be Parler, drawn off the back of him. Uh, Ray, Ray Parler, yeah. Ray Parler. What, what a player, what a man. What a man. I, would, a man. I will toast a Cobra bomb to Ray Parler's gingerness. <laughs> 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 and what about and what about, I mean like a few of the we've got to give a few Irish players yes Paul McShane Paul McShane like, good friend of I, mine Paul head of hair. You know. Here, I think I think there's a separate list for the most ginger players of all time and I think it's at the top of the list oh Dave oh. Kitson good shout, good shout. Uh, and, and you know what as well Gary Doherty or Gary yeah. Doherty as they say in England um, Alexi, you, Alexi you Lallis of course the, ah, well, he was the, just poor wasn't he he was a poor player so you can't be throwing Alexi Lallis into the mix Dave Kitson is so ginger, even I would take the piss out of him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but I've got a lot of respect for Dave Kitson because he qualified for Ireland and said, look, I'm not Irish. I, I, I'm not going to play for you. So I've got a lot of respect for Dave Kitson. Yeah. So do I. Mark, Mark Noble. Yeah. yeah. Um, the, I, I mean, there's half of them there that we mentioned, Gary Darty, the, the uh, James Collins. They get, you know, this idea, the ginger Pele. How many players have you heard called the ginger Pele? And it's never, <laughs> let's face it, it's never meant as a compliment. <laughs> yeah, I'd probably say so. Yeah, and, and I was saying before about you know the mocking. Yeah, I, I I probably would have done it in in the past myself. People would have picked up on my you know um, bad looks or whatever. People would and be coming for me for whatever reason they're going to come for me. So I would have probably bit back at someone and said you ginger so and so in the past. Yeah, uh, just a way to get back at somebody. Yeah, so yeah, there you go. Was Sean Thornton a quiet ginger? Yeah, Sean's another ginger, wasn't he? Yeah, good player, died, Sean, as well. Died blonde, but I'd say most people would, would remember that. Yeah, died blonde. Um, and then I, I was even thrown um, uh, Tomas O'Shea through into me as well. Of course, it's the Gooch. So there was loads <laughs> of like Gaelic footballs that were thrown to me. But if you're, if, you're having, if, you're having, if you're having the Gooch, then I simply have to have Kieran McDonald. He's a ginger, surely, as well, isn't he? Is he? No. Ah, it's got to be. No. Surely to God, yeah. That, that said, herd's big dying. No chance. As soon as someone starts dying the herd 10 times over, no. then you, you, you've got to start asking questions, haven't you? If Kieran McDonald is ginger, that really does change the whole scope of my childhood. Like, he was the, the sex icon of the 2000s. I could have pointed to him instead of pointing to Prince <laughs> Harry as the, the go-to ginger person <laughs> that I aspire to be. <laughs> But this is this is, I, I I will not accept that. Yeah, uh, I will not. I think I think, I think I think I think I think I think Kim McDonald is a, is a secret ginger. Yeah. Well, hey, Boris Becker, of course, but we can't uh, we're not we can't talk about him anymore. So um, yeah, there's there are that's it's a whole other conversation for a different day. We, we draw the scope open a little bit more. I'm not I sure know, we're I know. five, Kev. But... I know I've probably bored you on it now as well. I've bored no, no. you on it, yeah. But, but, but I there... say, I, I I did put the tweet out to say, yeah, I've been chatting to a friend about the best ginger footballers of all time, and it was you, Adrian. So I have to say yes, that yes. I was chatting to you that day about who these uh, top five gingers are, and I said it should be a segment in the show. You and Owen yeah. Friday morning. Oh. A ginger sports star, male, female, whoever. Well, to bring the conversation full circle, I can't wait for the review of today's show. It'll be coming through tomorrow afternoon. You'll be like, that football segment, oh, I dragged the arse out of it. It was supposed to be half an yeah. hour. Ended up as 45 minutes. Um, yeah, geez, you'll be listen. on for 50 minutes. 50 minutes now. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good slap up. Yeah, yeah. You have to put break this up into two parts of the show, I think. <laughs> yeah, two weeks, three weeks. Listen, uh, thanks a million for jumping on. Don't leave it too long the next time. No, no, thanks a lot. Thanks, guys. And thanks for everybody as well. Hope you're all well.